It's good to know that it's not about us. It is about Jesus, isn't it? And uh, when we worship him, that sort of is made real to us. We remember that whatever we're going through at this time, it isn't about us. It's about him. It's about him being glorified in us. And um, I almost don't really want to, to speak because I think there's just so much that God has been speaking to us this morning, but I will carry on. Um, but uh, that we do need to trust him. He's our strength. He's the one who knows the beginning and the end. He's the one that we can totally trust in every situation that we're in. Well, we're looking at, at um, Paul still in Acts, and we're in Acts 24, and we're going to be reading from Acts 24, 1 through to 23. After five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoyed much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation in every way and everywhere, we accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. We have found this man a plague one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of a sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him you, yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the charges, affirming that all these things were so. And when the gov governor had nodded, to him to speak, Paul replied, knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that, is, that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to, to worship in Jerusalem. And, you did not find, and they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, neither in the temple, nor in the synagogues, nor in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they are now bringing up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing in everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always make pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring arms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you and to make an accusation should they have anything against me. Or, let, or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council, other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial to this, to you, before you this day. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off saying, when Lysias, the, tri the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. And he gave orders to the centurion that he should be given in, take, kept in custody but have some liberty and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending his needs. We see in this story, in fact, Luke sort of goes into lots of courtroom drama throughout this, this part of Luke's, Luke, of, of Acts. But we see in this story that there are, there are four different people here or four different sections of people um, we've got Felix who is the governor of, of, um, of, of uh, Judea at the time 
And then we got Tertullus, who may, most probably possibly was a Roman um, lawyer that the elders had decided to bring in to try this case. They decided it wasn't enough for them to argue. They were going to bring someone who knew the Roman judicial uh, um, system. And then we have the Jews, the high priests and the elders. And finally, of course, we have Paul right in the middle of this. And Paul comes out as the man who is the man of integrity. We see Tertullus and, and the way he tries to flatter um, the Roman governor, Felix. He tries to flatter him and says about the wonderful things that he had done for, for um, Judea. But in actual fact, um, is that he is causing insurrection. Now, this is a man who's going around, he's causing trouble all over the place. He's not just in Jerusalem, but throughout the world, he's causing trouble amongst the Jews. And this would have been a worry to the Romans. If you remember earlier on in Corinth, when he was dragged before Gallio, I think his name was, um, uh, and the Jews dragged Paul before him. And got, once he realized that this was all about a Jewish um, uh, religious arguments, he wasn't interested. And Tertullus knew enough about this man to know that if he just came and said, this is a religious thing, it, he probably would dismiss it. So he makes it seem that Paul is causing trouble, which might lead to trouble for Felix. He's a plague, um, Tertullus says. Paul's a plague. His message spreads like, 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 a, you know, like a, a disease around. If only we were, were plagues in the, in the right sense, that we were spreading the righteousness of God, which, of course, is what Paul was doing. But... In, in Tertullus's eyes, Paul was a plague, and he was a ringleader of, of a heretical sect. The Romans recognised the Jews, but these Christians, they seem to be outside of the Jewish thing. And that would have worried Felix as well. And then the final charge that Tertullus brings is that Paul had profaned the temple. But Paul makes his defence. And in, the, in seeing these, these other three lots who there is very little integrity, we see a man who has great integrity and who can say with honesty that he's not guilty of these charges. He'd only been in, in Jerusalem for 12 days and most of that time it appears he's been imprisoned. And he hadn't gone around to the synagogues. He hadn't gone around preaching Christ or stirring up trouble in the synagogues or in the streets. He hadn't done it in the temple either. Paul could say honestly that there were, these charges were completely wrong. He was ceremonially clean, he says, when he was found in the temple. And this way that he, that he believed in, that was the charge that was true that he was a member of the way. He was a member of those who believed in Jesus. He says that he doesn't see this as, um, as being outside of Judaism, but he sees this as the fulfillment of all the promises that God had made to the Jews. And when Paul preached Christ to the Jews, he was preaching the fulfillment of the scriptures. He wasn't trying to start a separate religion he was trying to show the Jews that Christ is the fulfillment. Jesus is the fulfillment, the one they've longed for. I often think that when Paul preached to the Jews, his brothers and sisters, that he did it in tears when they didn't listen because they were missing the very thing that they had been looking for. Paul says in, in, in verse 16, 
So I always make pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Sorry, my mouth's drying up. I always make pains to have a clear conscience towards God and man. Paul was a man of integrity. Now that doesn't guarantee if we, if we live a life of integrity, it doesn't guarantee that everything will go well. And we can see for Paul, it didn't go well. Just because we're honest and we do the right thing doesn't necessarily mean that we will, re we will reap the praises of people. And we can think of other cases in scripture like Joseph, who refused to go to bed with Potiphar's wife because he knew it was unrighteous and he ended up being thrown in a prison. I mean, we know the outcome of it, but he had no way of knowing what was going to happen. Um, but he, was, he, he suffered because he was a man of integrity. For Paul, it was important that he had a clear conscience before God and before man. It wasn't enough just to talk about these things. He, he, he embodied it in, in, in himself. In 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 to 5, it says, But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am thereby but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in the darkness and will dis disclose the purposes of heart, when each one will receive his commendation from, the Lord, from God. So although Paul's saying he's got a clear conscience, he's not saying that he's guiltless, but he's saying he tries in all things to have a clear conscience. And as Christians, that should be the model for our the way that we live. That when we've done, no, we done wrong to others, that we, we do our best to put things right. When we find sin in our lives, that we ask God that he would help us to overcome those things and that we receive the forgiveness that's been given us in Jesus. To have a clear conscience before God is of great worth to know that we will one day stand before him and know that we can stand before him with a, with a clear conscience has much worth. As Paul says in that passage I just read, that, um, that we will receive con 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 commendation from God. We see Paul's motivation in verse 15 as to why he sought to have a clear conscience. conscience. He says, that he believed in the resurrection of both the just and the unjust. This is the motivation. In fact, I think this is the only place in scripture where it talks about a res resurrection, not just of the just, but of the unjust as well. That there is a judgment. This is a hard part for us sometimes as modern Christians. We, we've sort of gone away from the days when everyone preached hell and damnation to the point where we're frightened to talk about judgment. But Paul saw this as a motivation for the way he lives. He says in 1 Corinthians 9, 4, 24 to 27, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I, I do not box as one beat in the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now, I don't think Paul's talking about losing his salvation. Our salvation is secure. But there are other scriptures that talks about rewards that God will give us and, and, and when we are finally a stand before Christ. He says in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 9 to 10, so whether you are at home or away, or sorry, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 
so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So that the motivation for Paul's, um, uh, for Paul's integrity, for him wanting to be honest and to have a clear conscience before both God and man was that there will be a time when he will stand before God. And the one thing he wants to hear is the words, my good and faithful servant. And it should be the motivation for us in our lives that we live to hear Christ say, my good and faithful servant. We're not all called to do the things that Paul's doing, but God doesn't ask us to do more than what he's given us. He gives us what we're able to cope with. And he enables us by his spirit. It's not just about us doing it in our strength. As I was saying after our worship, it's all about him and what he does in us. It's not about us being perfect and good. It's about him, but that we should still try to live lives that imitate Jesus. So that when, if we were like Paul and we were called and, and accused of something, we could say in all innocence, I'm not guilty. Because our lives are all the way through filled with Jesus. So we see this man, Paul, standing before Felix, being accused by all these different people of wrongdoing. And I can almost see him standing there, peaceful, knowing that his conscience is clear before God. And in some ways, there are, um, there are sort of parallels with, with Jesus and uh, Pilate saying, here's the man. And I think that when Paul stood before before uh, Felix, what you saw was what you got. And if you read what Paul says here and you read his letters, you can see that Paul tried to live the life that he, um, he spoke about. He, there was no, he tried not to be hypocritical. I'm sure he wasn't perfect. And as we read earlier, he said he doesn't even judge himself, but he, he, he tries to live in a way that's pleasing to God. So in conclusion, integrity should be something that we as Christians should aim for. We should aim to live lives of a clear conscience, that we should um, seek to, to keep our accounts short. Now, I'm not talking about losing salvation here. I want to keep emphasizing if you forget to, to, to confess something, you're going to get slammed. It's not that, but it's about being being in trying to live in a Christ-like way. It's not a guarantee of an easy life. Paul didn't have an easy life because he tried to live this way. But he's tried to follow Jesus no matter what. And having a clear conscience before God is in itself its own reward. To have peace. To know there's no finger that's pointing against you that is that is that can do it you know for real and even if we have failed that we've we've sought our best to put things right that in itself is is of great benefit to us to have a clear conscience before God to know that we're going to stand before him one day and know that we can hear him say to us, good and faithful servants. That's the reward that each of us looks for. And that's the reward that Paul, I believe, was looking for. Let's pray. Father, when we look at Jesus, we see a perfect man with no failings. And sometimes, Lord, that's almost a bit too much for us because... We know as humans that we, we fail and there are things in us that, that shouldn't be there. And yet you give us examples like Paul, who, who was a man, um, a human just like us with frailties, who no doubt got things wrong, but who did everything he could to make his life to conform to Jesus. That he trusted your spirit to change him and to 
bring about in his life more and more Christ-likeness. And we would ask, Father, for ourselves, that we would have this one goal. That one goal will be, would be to show Jesus in all that we do and all that we say, to have lives of integrity, Lord, to have lives that, where we can say that we have a clear conscience before God and man because we have sought you, Lord. We give you thanks, Father, for your great love and your kindness. We thank you, you call us who are people who fail and often go astray and you love us still, Lord. We thank you for the certainty that we have in Jesus, that we will stand before your face, that we will be as bold as lions before you because of what he's done for us. Amen.